New York's classic rock, Q1043. Hopefully, the summer is unwinding, and I can't wait for being in person with friends and with my musician friends. But till then, we're still Zooming. Hi, Peter Asher. Welcome. Hi, Ken. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. And yes, I, I've I've had both my shots now, so my superpowers are kicking in. I shall be... Uh, I should be, you know, out there with real people at some point, I hope. Congratulations. Now you can fly and jump tall buildings in a single bound Absolutely. and everything else. Spider powers, whatever whatever it takes. As as I've always said on the air, uh, you know, there's a tracking chip in the shot. Do you have a phone? Do you have a credit card? Don't worry about <laughs> being tracked. Really, don't worry about it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so... You know, a, a year ago, almost to the day we were doing our li last live breakfast with the Beatles for George Harrison's birthday, and, you know, we all kind of thought, I think this would be a couple of months, not a year and going on more. Uh, but here we are, George's birthday again. And I wanted to talk to the man who, not just from the Beatles, but worked at Apple. I want, if you would put on your Apple hat sure. for a little while. I talked with uh, Alan Steckler oh. a so while back. Sorry, Alan what? Alan Steckler. Oh, Yeah. So uh, one of the things he said to me was that he was with George. They brought, uh, you know, they brought uh, Bangladesh. He heard All Things Must Pass. And he s said to him, this album is just amazing. It's gorgeous. And George said, they wouldn't let me record any of these. Um, re I keep thinking, really, you didn't hear All Things Must Pass and think, well, that's that's better than some of the stuff we have. Like, they really wouldn't let it get in there. What was the vibe? What was going on with George and the gods, John and Paul? Well, you know, George... Uh George never said much in general. So, so I mean, if, if for him to actually say they wouldn't let me record that, to be that clear and specific about it, is is quite unusual. But yeah, there, there was a always a sense of rivalry. But I think only someone who was really in the studio, which is to say, the Beatles themselves and George Martin, really, you know, maybe people like Jeff Emmerich. But but uh, I, you know, I was an occasional visitor. But one was aware that certainly there were certain certain number of slots on the album and there was a there was a deliberate sense of allocation you know so the, maybe george would get a slot or possibly two slots or something so so uh yeah and you could tell that he was annoyed about that and it's just it's part of what made the beatles so amazing of course is that it did consist of people each of whom on their own would have become hugely successful stars you know and if george had been in any other band he would have been the lead singer lead guitar player and songwriter you know but he ended up in a band um where he, he was none, none none of those things but if you're in the best band that ever was and ever will be that's kind of a small price to pay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, as you and i have said many times he's the greatest singer songwriter in any band that doesn't have john lennon or paul mccartney in it it's exactly it's that quite, simple quite true. but exactly you know, I, I always think, though, for all his resentment of his creativity being stifled, so especially in the later years, you know, you, you did buy Friar Park and have a place in Hawaii, which perhaps would not have happened had there not been something called the Beatles that you as a 14-year-old kid ran into this craziness and did. Um, you know, his work afterwards, and this ties in, we talked a little bit about Phil Spector. Um you know his his what he was as a human being his dysfunctionality his violence his bipolar whatever it was the quality of his work for me my two cents i thought it sounded great in the late 50s early 60s but by the time we get to pepper you know the recording techniques even without pro tools has moved on a great deal to me and i always felt like it sort of passed him by. I don't think he helped Imagine or George Harrison as much as technically he held it back. I honestly think if it was you or George Martin or somebody else in the studio producing, it would have been brighter. It would have had more life. I'm serious about that. Yes, I think in some cases that, that might be true. Uh, Phil was, you know, overly confident, perhaps. You know, he, 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 <laughs> he, he thought that his way was the way and that he, he thought he was a genius and he kind of was, but geniuses are much better when they don't realize they're a genius and they're still trying to really work at it. Phil, you know, I think got sucked into us as, as many people do into his own image as, as, as the, the, the mad genius. And he took the genius part seriously. And unfortunately the mad part seriously as well. 
You're absolutely right. I mean, he just, he loved the big room echo, which I get that really <clears> pops <throat> on, you know, AM radio that we had as teenagers with little transistors that were holding up. It sounded bigger. But when you listen to, you know, John's voice or George's voice in that big echo, these are these, are these gorgeous voices that I well, want to hear front and center. You know, it, later yes. as they start working with Jack Douglas and others, it's just, it's beautiful to hear them sing. We don't, I don't want them hidden. I want to hear them clearly. I know, but that, that, well, that applied even more to John than to George because it's clear that John liked all those effects on his voice. He was, he was worried about his voice. You know, he always... So, because left to his own devices, there's hardly a single song that he doesn't double track or process or reverb or do something to, you know? And those occasional songs where he just sings into a mic and puts it on tape sound absolutely bloody fantastic because of that, you know? George had a great voice too, so, you know, um, yeah, it's it, it, that 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 is a strange phenomenon. And Phil Spector brought something to the table, of course he does, did, but, was he the ideal producer for everything he got to do? I I agree with you, not necessarily. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a good producer knows how to do double tracking and slap back Epco and, and all the tricks. But a great producer is the one who convinces these two men, your voice, like you just said, at a piano is as good as it can get. It's nothing is more beautiful. Please don't screw around with it like like Jack did on Double Fantasy. Uh, you know, like like Jeff Lynne did with George in the later years. Let's just hear you sing. Um, yeah. I think about the artists that you built from, from James Taylor to Rinda, Linda Ronstadt and others. You understood the power of their voice that the star of the thing was production. The yes, star but of the I, never, was... I was never the kind of producer Phil was. So he was the kind of producer who believed that his sound, the the wall of sound, the Phil Spector magic, was the was almost the artist, and the the singer was um, one of the contributors to that sound, um, and and that worked. You know, I mean, he made you know River Deep, Mountain High alone get puts him in the official genius category. It's one of the greatest records ever made, you know, and not based around necessarily how great Tina Turner is, though she is, but it is genuinely a tribute to, to Phil. I mean, the sound of that record is colossal, but I just, I never made records like that. Um, I was, the, those albums you talk about, the James albums and the George, and, and the James albums and the Linda albums were based around, as you say, their voice. My mission was to frame their voice as, as well as I could. And George, certainly was somebody who appreciated that. I mean, he was a, a James fan. I remember, you know, when I first found James and, and told him we were going to sign him and brought him into Apple, you know, George was one of the people who totally got it. George and Paul in particular, both kind of went, absolutely, yes, this guy's the real thing. And and I made the record based around exactly what they had heard that day in Savile Row when he sat down and played a few songs for them. Wow, I, you know, go over that moment a little bit. This this long haired, like skinny folk song teenager from I don't know if it was te- what was it about twenty or so twenty one. Yeah, about like, twenty, I think. Yeah, yeah. It, you walk him into Apple. Like what a what a moment. We've talked around it, but were, were he was he terrified? Was he confident? What was I James couldn't like? really tell. It, James is so um, self effacing, much more so then. You know, he he he's still, you know generally saying sort of sitting down and looking at his feet you know and and it was hard to to tell um what he was really thinking because he was shy and and worried and and had a lot of other stuff on his mind as well and so but i i confess i don't think i really realized how what a big deal it must in fact be because obviously when we first met as you know he didn't even know i'd i'd got this job we met through our mutual friend Danny Korchmar gave him my gave James my number he called up he came over to my flat played me a couple of songs on tape and and then set, picked up my guitar and played me a couple more and I went this is amazing this is some of the best stuff I've ever heard in my life it so happens I've got this new job you know as head of A&R for a record label I can sign people would you like a record contract and he went yes I'd love one and it was kind of that simple and <laughs> then I did you know told him of course all about Apple and whose label it was and said, you know, you have to come and meet everybody. And even though you could, you could never forget, of course, that the Beatles are the Beatles and it was a big deal, but I didn't really think it through that. I was telling James that in tomorrow or the next day or whatever, I forget, I think there was a day or two in between, we would be going by Apple and, and meet whatever Beatles were around. And, and James being James just kind of nodded, you know, and 
he didn't go, you know, really? Are you serious? You know? So, yeah, but I, thinking back on it, of course, he must have been somewhat freaked out because that was when the Beatles were just becoming the toast of the universe, you know. Everybody talks about that moment. Our mutual, our late friend, Neil Innes, whom I love dearly, and he's recording with the Bonzos at Abbey Road and just going down the hallway to get some tea. And he said, the front door opens and, and there they were coming in. You could see in silhouette, there was this golden light coming behind them from outside. <laughs> and he said, it was just, all that was missing was the chorus of angels singing. And you saw the, the outline and you just standing there going, holy crap. Like, right. look at this. They, they exist. <laughs> they are real people. Yes. One of his, my favorite stories that he told, as funny a songwriter, as, as great a comedian, musical comedian as he was, he said they're working on songs and they were covering, you know, they found old, like, sort of vaudeville songs. Yeah. Uh, you know, my, yeah. my father plays the music for all the talkies. And right. he said, right. Paul wanders into the studio and said, hey, what you working on? And we, he, he said, me and Vic Stanshaw just looked at him and said, nothing. <laughs> it was too embarrassing to play Paul. He goes, no, let's play it. No, nothing. It's, we don't even belong here. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's true. They they were, you know, there was always this, a certain degree of intimidation. You know, however well one thought, one, one, knew, one knew them. And obviously I knew Paul the best. I, you know, I, I never was particularly close to George. You know, we, we worked together. Certainly he would come to my A&R meetings and, and always had, useful contributions and obviously made some great records for for apple himself i mean um that jackie lomax album is a favorite of mine and i remember going to several of those sessions just because the band was so colossally good it was fun listening to george doing it you know because that, that's when it was ringo and klaus vorman and uh nikki hopkins and eric clapton and george which is not a bad band by any standards. <laughs> right. That, right. I mean, that's a phenomenal house band. I, I know yeah. they wanted their own record label, and it, oh, Apple mm -hmm. made sense to me. But it seems like an, it's what you said all the time, that they were just so bored with being record executives that it wasn't in their DNA. They were creators. Um, if they just stepped away and just let you... And, and and the Ken Mansfields of the world, you know, if, if they just let the people who had become executives run it and just kind of keep an eye on it for them, do you, could it have survived as a label? I mean, because there was just so much talent coming through. Oh, yes, it certainly could. I think it was more, uh, to be honest, it was all the non-record label ventures that Apple's drifted into that contributed more to Apple's overall confusion and eventual demise. You know, uh, Magic Alex and the sh the shop and the clothes and the movies and no, although you know, ended up, ended up of course George ended up being a very successful movie mogul and producer and and everything on his own. But I think it was Apple's o overreaching into other areas that, that might have been more its downfall, and the fact that the Beatles ended up having arguments amongst themselves you're starting to not gel as a band and you're shooting at each other. I mean, that, that tape that surfaced uh, last year of them recording a meeting at Apple to send to Ringo because Ringo wasn't there. And John saying, hey, on the next album, George should have two songs. The next album? Did John Lennon really say on the next album? As in, did he have a concept that there was another album to come? I was just stunned by... As Ringo said, they're having their Barneys. There was a quote in Rolling Stone when they asked John Lennon, what would you think of All Things Must Pass? And he said, it's all right. It goes on a bit, doesn't it? I'm like, come on, John. Come on. Come on. Seriously, come on. That makes perfect sense. Yes. <laughs> That's an extremely John quote. You know, he gets two of the biggest stars on Abbey Road. The ones that are most requested it are something and here comes the sun with his john's come together uh, you know a close third but really just from the audience perspective that i've been doing my whole life in radio those two songs are in the lead those are the two star songs off off abbey road oh yeah i mean even on the whole you know when i do that uh, top 100 thing the george is always incredibly well represented in the top 10 
You know, there's no question about it. It's not as if you had to go down into the halfway down the charts to find the George section. No, no, not at all. You know, all things must pass and something in the way she moves. I mean, something um, to give it its correct name are always right up there, you know, with the with the with the winners of winners. In this year of COVID-19, Sunday morning, the Breakfast with the Beatles show has has grown exponentially it's it's something that's comfort it's comforting food you know it's it's macaroni and cheese it's a it, it's a warm blankie and people are listening w- more than ever not because i'm any better at it but the music the music is the star and i'm telling you for the last 11 months i could play here comes the sun beware of darkness getting better all you need is love with a little help from my friends those five songs it are requested every single week by multiple people because here it's the it's such a message of hope it's yeah. such a message of kindness and that's the one thing it doesn't matter about the clothes or belly dancing or the fireworks on stage those messages of it's going to be okay uh, let it be it's the most important message now they always say what would john be writing or george be writing now if they were alive that's it i mean they wrote it Yes, I think you're right. Yes, absolutely so. Um, in looking back, when you see George's career, and I just saw there was a video the other night, I was watching it again, the making of the Traveling Wilburys. You said a bunch of superstar friends who happen to be free for a couple of weeks, and they knock out this album. And to see the true joy in their faces, and George has a comment at one point, he said, I miss being in a band. Yeah, I think every ex-band member seems to say that at one time or another. I mean, certainly, I think that's where Wings came from. You know, I think um, uh, a lot of people realize that even though you can hire better musicians than were in the band with you, you know, in by most technical standards, you can hire incredibly great players who can do anything you ask them to. There's still something about having equal band members who can actually make comments and, and disagree and and throw in creative ideas of their own that must be listened to because they're partners um it's a different kind of music and it it, it works remarkably well that's you know the, the same with the stones you know when mick made his solo albums he's probably thinking oh you know great i can i can use some some genius bass player now that bill's not here or whatever it is and in fact it ends up being not as good. You know, I know Pete Townsend used to get really pissed off with Keith Moon's crazy drumming, you know, and relish the idea of using a, a more kind of normal drummer. And then you find out that Keith's manic fills and, and approach were, were a big part of what we all loved about The Who. And, you, you, you know, so, yeah, bands have a certain magic to them that, that hiring musicians who do what they're told, however genius they are, doesn't quite do the same thing. Absolutely. Was Ringo a great drummer? Ringo was the greatest drummer who ever lived for a band called the Beatles. Yeah. His fills, his shuffles, just the, the patterns he built on, on from Here Comes the Sun to come together to the early days. It's brilliant. It's not that Neil Peart wasn't faster or more technical or that there are other drummers that are louder or more forceful, but I, it's inconceivable that there was be a better drummer through those albums and to play than Ringo because he had the right sound in his head for what those songs needed. Yeah, and he listened to the song and everything. And, and and you're absolutely right. And what's the proof of that is that the people who think Ringo wasn't a, a, a fantastic drummer never includes drummers. Every drummer knows how important Lin, that Ringo is. You'll never find a drummer who goes, ah, eh, he's kind of, you know, not as good as Buddy Rich or whatever, you know, some <laughs> right. nonsensical thing. That's what some critic might say, that kind of stuff. But you'll never find a drummer who doesn't understand why Ringo was and is a genius. Uh, Peter, just some final words about sure. George Harrison, about his post-Beatles life in music. What were your highlights from his solo career? I think the Wilburys. Um, uh, well, if, if you count that as part of his solo career, which in a way it is, I think. it's, it's I do, to me, an yeah. An extension of his solo career. I just love the idea that somebody you can sit, in, if, that if you're George Harrison, and only if you can sit in your living room and go, you know, it would be cool to have a band. You know, who would we like to have in our band? Well, you know, let's have Bob Dylan. Let's have Roy Orbison, this, that, and the other, you know. And and next thing you know, you just get your phone out and they all say yes. You know, that is so specifically a George thing. I mean, there's, there's nobody else but a Beatle who could do that. And no other Beatle with, the, with the, the, the brains and enthusiasm and balls to just do it. 
um, than George. So it's such a brilliant achievement. Get Jeff Lynn, you know, and then when you got Jeff, sit, look through your phone book, pick all these other people and make, and then it works. You make a brilliant record because you might think, what on earth are Bob Dylan's, you know, and 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 those people are going to sound like singing together, you know, someone with an exquisite voice like Roy Orbison and someone with a very strange voice like Bob Dylan. How does how do you fit that all together? And he did effortlessly. That's the to me, Jeff Lynn's true genius is saying, how does that mix? It doesn't. So I'm going to put them back to back. Yeah. Everybody, oh, yeah. I'm so tired of being. <laughs> and is that operatic exactly. thing? That's exactly. The, that's what a great producer does is think outside the box. And, oh, Jeff and, is Jeff is unspeakably brilliant. I'm, you know, Jeff is 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 a good friend, and I and uh, I admire him enormously. And he's he's incredibly nice guy, incredibly smart, and made some of the best records ever. And and uh, uh, you know, I was an ELO fan, obviously, the minute he invented them back in the day. And and yes, the, the, he, the, that you know, Wilbury's is clearly a, a co-project between him and George, and it's they both contributed exactly what they needed to. And, and those albums stand up incredibly well. And a lot of, you know, super groups absolutely don't. That, right. There's do. too much ego clashing, but that's yeah. friends. As, as he <clears throat> said in the, in the doc, we're, we're friends. It every, he said the biggest problem was everybody wanted to lay back and yeah. nobody, everybody's like, George, you just do it. Like, no, I, it, that's not why I asked you here. I didn't right. ask you here right. to watch me make a record. Tom Petty in the documentary says, I was fine just to watch. I, I didn't have to pick up a guitar. They made me like write and play stuff, but I just wanted to hang out. Exactly. And I think that that's why it works. There's one quick story. Dave Stewart was up years back because they recorded at Dave Stewart's house, right? That that was his house. And he said, uh, before this even came, a friend was coming to stay with me from London, an old friend, and he was staying for a couple of weeks. And I said to him, listen, some friends are coming by. They're going to make an album, but don't worry about it. You know, they do their own thing. You know, you'll be fine. Plenty of coffee. Everybody's relaxed. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. And his friend pops in. He picks him up at LAX, brings him home. And the, then these musicians show up the next day. Yeah, yeah. And he said, you didn't tell me it was George Harrison and Bob Dylan and Tom <laughs> Petty. And, and he said, it's really fine. Yeah. And he, he tells the story. My next morning, my friend got some coffee and he's sitting out by the pool and just, you know, sort of getting your sea legs after flying uh, across across the ocean. And... Bob Dylan comes out and joins him for coffee. Hi. Hi. Mm. He says, you want to hear a new song I'm working on? Sure. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> and Bob starts playing a new song. And George sits down on the other chaise. And hears Bob playing a new song. And just to pull focus, George starts playing Here Comes the Sun. Mm. And Bob turns to George and goes, do you mind? I'm playing him a song. Oh, sorry, Bob. <laughs> and my friend came in to me and said, I'm going to a hotel. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that's great yeah should have filmed that yeah, exactly there was something to film peter asher thank you so much for your time as always you've been such a friend and as i've always said about peter uh get the book beatles a to z because it's just a wonderful it's not it's not it's not a, about facts. It's about your recollection, about your feelings about it. And this is the one person who has walked in every camp to start your connection to Paul McCartney, dating your sister, from performer, Peter and Gordon, to producer, to manager, to record executive. Nobody has the perspective of the whole scene like you do. Everybody has a part, but you've seen the whole arc. And I always thank you so much for sharing it. No, thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And, and, you know, we're all here to celebrate George Harrison, one of the great geniuses of rock and roll, and I'm proud to do that. Thank you so much. Here's to the day of coming back to New York and we can grab some food and be together again. Absolutely. Absolutely. New York's classic rock, Q1043.